Welcome, everybody. Time for another episode of Director's Commentary, Survivor Man style. And this time, uh, I just uh, so I was, was going to go retro, and then I was sort of looking through. Uh, I've got the DVDs at home, and uh, landed on the uh, Alaskan episode. This one is sort of uh, infamous because it also contains the 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 moment where I where I had that crazy experience of the big sort of ape sound coming at me from the forest. So, but there's a lot that went on behind the scenes on this episode. Whew. And um, kind of let me put it this way: there's some stuff I still can't talk about. But I'll tell you what I can. Let's watch. The extra portrayed in this show are carried out by a professional. That's me. Don't attempt to du duplicate them without supervision. That would be mine. Some scenes contain graphic comment, content for your discretion. Is advised. Uh, There's the rod. That fish. is gnarly. Here's the tease. Is he going to eat it, they're asking? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that was a short tease. The teases are chosen um, by. Uh, normally by Barry Farrell, my editor. Uh, he'll he'll search through the content, he'll go through the storyline that I've laid out, and uh, and as the edit gets put together, um, we sort of wait, and there's always something that kind of jumps out at him. And uh, you know, very rarely, maybe 15%, 20% of the time, I might say, no, I try this as a tease, or try that as a tease, and and uh, I'm being and we do that, but a lot of times he just picks them up. Alaska. There we go. Where jagged mountains shed their cold glacial waters. So this, uh, you know, this is, um, I forget what season this is. A way of life. So three, maybe? Sea kayaking up here is a powerful experience, and not one you can approach casually. All right. So the sea kayaking was a scenario I wanted Every to lay out. Um, I've done a lot of sea kayaking in my life. I used to be a sea kayak guide. So all of that was very comfortable to me. And so basically the premise here being pretty simple, sea kayaker, can't get away from where he is, stuck, lost. Um, maybe uh, ocean too big to get out, that kind of thing. These waters are frigid. Weather here can change quickly. Even rescue can be held so that shot right there, see that? Of the environment. That seal popping up. Oh, that was the luck. That was beauty. Luck of timing. Alaskan coastal waters are rich with killer um, whales, seals, What it was is we were shooting the intro, and, and um, at this point, my, my shooter, was, uh, who's been a long time uh, 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 part of my team, is uh, Max Atwood. And he's a tremendous uh, cameraman. Um, in fact, he came to work for me right out of uh, school. So he, with Max and a few others, they came, out, they came on as interns. And you know what? Stayed with the Survive Man Productions for quite a long time. I still work with Max to this day. Um, and uh, this was uh, one of Max's early shoots, and he was just filming me doing this stuff here, the, this scene here, where I'm, I believe it was, where I'm just doing my intro. And, uh, oh, I remember what we started here. And uh, he's just right place, right time. He was filming, we saw the seal, but then the seal popped up right in between him and I, and that's exactly all that is, right place, right time for the cameraman. This is, um, I'm trying to remember when I first started doing this, but along the way, uh, decided to do more formal introductions to the location. And with a good team on my side, uh, uh, good, some cameramen, they weren't going to obviously spend the week with me, but, but to start off and to, to film the opening, I had this opportunity. And so this is the, sort of the start of a lot better uh, film work in my mind as far as uh, producing this, the Survivor Man show. No fresh water. That's a layup. No food. No fresh water. I'm carrying only a knife, multi-tool, and a fire piston. And to keep this experience authentic, I'll stay out here, alone, for a week. A safety camp has been set up somewhere along the coast. And I'll paddle and search the shoreline for food, shelter, and a place to survive for seven days. Where I stay out here will depend on what I find. But the production crew leaves me alone now. The rest of the filming is up to me. I still I having to say a lot of that because a lot of times this is the, this is the big year. This is the year when it really Survivor Man was really exploding. Copycat shows were coming out, and uh, what would happen is I just I was there was a lot of new fans watching, and so I, a lot of you know we repeat often. Hey, uh, this is how this show is made. This is what's going on. So if somebody watching it brand new you know, for the first time would get the idea. When we were shooting the opening scenes. Uh, um, I think it was. Or no, later, later on, Max was uh, 
out getting the, the beauty shots we said. So there's always a crew that goes out to get the sunset, snow. sunrises and the time Down lapses and the leaves there. and the trees blowing and the butterflies, stuff like that. And that's Fresh Max water. Atwood in this case. And he did something that became kind of a routine for him. Uh, mm. And that was he dropped my camera in the water, wow. and so it became. A, and he did that twice more, I think, and so it became a thing. Just keep Max and oh, my cameras away good. from the water. He was trying to do some sort of, some kayaking About sort of B-roll type here. footage and Can't drink the ocean water, so. camera right in the ocean. That's a great way to get rehydrated. All right, let me turn you around and uh, show you where I came from. <sighs> There's something to because it was. Not hot, but it wasn't cold either, and there's really something to just eating fresh snow when you need to get hydrated. And I mean, already just from paddling from where the crew left me to here, and I'm, I'm dehydrated. So. Doesn't take long. But not much else. So this time, I'm going to keep moving, keep paddling, and search for a better spot. Since it never really gets that dark this time of year, I'll paddle through the night. Oh, yeah. We were that far north of just tons of daylight. It's day two of my survival in Alaska. Night number one was spent mostly traveling, stopping only to curl up for a bit of sleep in the drizzling rain, and then carrying on again. Cool just sort of stopping the shoreline. winds continue to blow down the fjord as I try out some new camera mounts I had built for this survival odyssey. But there was... Without time to test them, Ooh. it's a surprise to me to discover just how top-heavy they make me which makes things dangerous for me and risky for the camera gear itself. Places like this... Yeah, for what I would gave up on that pretty damn quick. Uh, and you risk your life. I think this was something that was starting to happen while producing the series. I, was, I think this was the big year. I did a lot of episodes, can't remember, but it was, it was getting busy. And, uh, you know, uh, the reality is that to produce the Survivor Man episodes, I mean, I was really right, doing yeah, this stuff, and it's really hard on the body. You know, if I were to say to my, my survival cronies, dry, my buddies, and say, hey, let's go out and do a week-long survival thing, they'd go, yeah, sure, let's do it, all right, great, we go out and do a week-long survival. If I said, hey, let's do, do it ten times this year, go without food and water for seven days, it's nuts, not a chance, not even twice. Usually just once a year do survival, you know, instructors type types of go out and do this. So this was getting, this was, uh, you know, around that time when things were, um, they were demanding a lot more from me and it was just, by now the other shows are on the air and uh, it was ridiculous. So even something, it, it plays on you because even something as simple as properly taking the time to work out your camera gear on a kayak for kayak mounts and stuff like that, you need, you know, you need three or four days to test that stuff out. I didn't have any time. I landed in Alaska and tried to put together, I'll figure out while I'm out there because I've done that kind of thing before. And uh, okay. it was not to be the case. I could not get it to work very well. Huh. Not sure if he's going to dive bomb me or not. That's pretty nice. You know, this to be in a place like that and to where, just have the bald I mean, eagles around you all the time. You'll notice I got a different hat on. Uh, I started to have fun with it. You know, obviously I wore my bandana an awful lot, but... Ah, I thought we'd play around a bit ocean, and, and cool. uh, found that captain's hat on the way terrible. into the, right the expedition. And Not in this location. Let's go for a different look, a different Survivor Man look. A glass bottle, and I have no idea what's in it, but get rid of that. That'll help. I'll stay here for tonight, but sometimes survival means moving on. You know, it was raining for almost a week oh, yeah. before I got out here. People always figure you can't get dry tinder and dry wood if it's raining or if it's been raining a lot. You check out all those old stumps back there close to the eagle's nest and dig in deep enough, find yourself some nice dry tinder. I can use this. Now there's a the thing, you know, a uh, lot of rain on this oh, west coast. Beautiful. I used to say it, I've said this before even in director's commentary probably, that the, the measure of a good guide for me is you've been out on the trip and you, you know, say you've got clients, you're with guests, whatever, or your group. You've been out for three or four, you've got three or four days of rain. You should You're still be able to get a roaring so fire going, and put up a tarp and bring out the dark knife. chocolate and the scotch. Nope, that's the measure of a good wood guy. Like butter. And so that's some of the tricks to it. You know, it's been raining all this time, but look at that big pile of tinder I found, it's perfectly dry. Basic yeah, wood. it's an extra 15, 20 good minutes wood. of searching around, looking for things, but you get what you need to get a fire going. So I've got all of what I need, even though it's been raining there. 
and have it sitting right on top of wet or dry. And that's what I'm talking about right now at the moment, actually. All the shut moisture up. out of the ground and put your fire out, or at least makes it a lot harder to keep your fire going. I'm going to try a new method for starting a fire, something oh, I've yeah. never used before. Remember that punky wood that I gathered? Well, this is where it's going to come in handy. Don't need very much. So this is a fire piston. And what happens here is there's an airtight grip. And as you push in really hard, boom, hit that in really hard. It works just like the piston in an automobile. The air that is condensed and pressurized so quickly rises in temperature extremely rapidly. And if you've got a little tiny bit of tinder down there, some punky wood, it should actually ignite it. And this is one of those situations wood. where I had Drop never done there. this before, and I thought, I'm not going to practice before and camera. I'm, gonna, I'm going to experience this like for this. you guys right on camera. Right I tried to do that as much as I could throughout the Survivor Man series. Have I done this before? No. Could it work for me? Yeah. Don't practice. Don't practice. I had to resist the temptation to practice so I could just get it right, you know, but nope. no. And this was one of those times. I basically did not know what I was doing other than what I might have read. It's on the end. There we go. And there's that little... Look at that. There we go. Now I'm into my territory. I know what to do if I have a little tiny uh, glowing ember like that. At this point, it's the same as any other friction, fire by friction. Any other time you're trying to... Okay. Oh, except it didn't out. work. The purpose Take of using two. fire starting devices other than matches and lighters is that they can be used indefinitely without returning to civilization for resupply. There we go. That's going to take. Yeah, see that thick smoke yeah. when you've got that, you've There's got fire. To run out of, except for the natural and I think like uh, I think someone had uh, sent me that fire piston in. That happens a lot of times in Survivor Man as oh. well. People will send me in something Thank saying, "Hey, can you try this out?" Either because uh, they make them or they just want to know if they the work. Uh, so it's it's, uh, it's pretty cool when I get those things in from people. And the get the chance to try them out on the show. So now you can see what I'm doing. I'm making a big fire. And look what I found. An old running shoe. Not a big deal, except that out of the heel of it are the distinct markings of grizzly bear teeth. It's not a good omen. <laughs> Actually, that rubber shoe would be good for uh, signaling because you burn it, you get that black well, rubber smoke. And mistake, if you're trying to attract sure. attention, uh, attract attention, a lot of times uh, burning garbage, as horrible as it is from the environment, the uh, might land. save your life. And I didn't really look up to figure out where west was, where east was, and where the sun was going. So the other side of the bay is bathed in beautiful sunlight right now. And I'm already in the shadow of the mountains, which has me cool. That was a mistake. Oh, my cat is meowing. Ignore him. There you go. Find a bit of garbage. There's scum inside there, so. Ooh, there's scum in the lid. Don't use the lid but it's a way of collecting water. So you can see what I'm doing here. There's, I'm not, you don't want a small fire. When you've got lots of firewood kicking around, like on, if it's beach survival, I always say I'm beach survival. I'm talking survival here. You need it to stay alive. Biggest fire you can, you can make happen. If you can get a six or eight foot fire, then, uh, then go for it. That's too bad. I really uh, kind of was hoping that was going to be a bit of a bonus score for me. I put the glass right on the fire. I figured once it got to boiling, I'd be okay. But I mean, I was just sitting over, looking out over the ocean there, and I thought I heard something had come back, and too much heat. So I'm not boiling water tonight. No raspberry leaf tea for me. Ah, but with that fresh running stream, I'm fine. That's an often advantage of being in a mountainous area. There's just tends, I mean, I'm not talking about desert mountains, but it tends to be a lot of freshwater streams running all the time. And, and you know, I'll, I'll talk a lot about, you know, people get pretty fearful about Jardia and stuff, but it's such a slim thing. I mean, unless you're outside a city, outside of a town, you know, that sort of thing. Um, even, even swamp water. You know, uh, right now, the dew is coming down first of all, Jardy, they call it beaver feeder. That's a beaver fever, and that's a misnomer. Because 
you can find it in all kinds of uh, feces, animal feces, uh, not just beaver. So they, they take a bad, bad rap on that one. But uh, for the most part, dehydration will kill you a lot quicker than Giardia. Well, you get Giardia, you're not going to feel it for seven days. Hopefully you're out, take a pill, it's gone. Nothing to gather, nothing to pick and eat, nothing to catch. I'm going to move on. Rock's getting hot. See if I can find myself a good survival base camp. The general rule of thumb for survival is to stay put, but that is not always the best course. You know, I just, I don't know why I'm always so comfortable, you know, just sleeping in a situation like this. It's not that I don't keep like a third eye out for bear, it's, you know, because there's always bears walking around and grizzlies, and here there's grizzlies, you know. Um, but I think, I, you know, I'd spend an entire summer, uh, well, more than one summer, actually, many summers guiding, and, and a lot of those summers, um, I, as the guide, would sleep outside, uh, not in the tents. Uh, and it just got me incredibly comfortable with uh, staying out under the stars. So I can sleep even though I know there's wolves and bears walking around, potentially knowing I'm there. rain more. This is a rainforest. I don't think I'll wait for the tide to come back in. Shoot. There's a black bear. Oh, I forgot about this black bear. I have no idea if he... He's got to know I'm here. He's acting like he doesn't, though. Just about ready to go here. I suppose I could launch in here quick, but I don't want to have to leave a camera behind. Let's go see if I can catch it with the other camera. It's just a little guy. I'm going to get suited up here real quick so I can get in the water. I don't think I have any worry from him. I'm just going to hop in the kayak and paddle on. I found yesterday when I had the camera gear up and the first day it was just so top heavy the kayak always threatened to tip so to get to my next location I'm not going to film it I'm just going to pack the camera gear away and get going. Black bears and grizzlies abound in this area. This one as expected took off when he saw me but the massive yeah. grizzlies may be a little less intimidated by the sight. Yeah, I've come across so many black bears in, in, in my journeys all the so time. I mean, what's that rule of thumb? I mean, basically with a black bear, the Base rule camp. of thumb is scare them. Uh, oh, here comes the fish scene. Hang on, I'll get back to that. I wouldn't blame Hold that you thought. at all if you looked at this and said, oh, come on, that looks set up. Oh, yeah. But no word of a lie here. I didn't see it, and here it is laying here. Yeah, I mean, it I had to say that because even my... my Guys back in the he office, like, oh, come on, Les. I was like, no. Literally, I pulled up, and there's a, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to go, and that looks like a place I can build a shelter, and there's that fish laying there on the rock. That's happened to me a few times. It happened uh, with the lighter that had fuel in it on the island in Grenada, and I took some heat for that, like, come on, you staged that. I did not. Literally, there was a lighter laying there, and it had fuel in it and sparked. And in this case, that fish was laying there, and it was kind of gross, but. It was so fresh that I thought, oh, that's kind well, of gross. You can make some fish soup out of that. And I could also use it for bait. All right, it smells a bit fishy. There's a good hunk of meat there, though. Now, this is just to show you that if you had to, you can eat a lot of things raw. You'd be surprised how many things you can eat raw without getting sick. Sushi. With all the driftwood I've got, this should do just fine. It's right. good and solid. That's Obviously, sure. I get into building a shelter there. That, uh, uh, in truth, our culture, sure. and the various cultures throughout the years, the there, there is yeah, actually uh, raw uh, food here, dishes right, in just about every culture and rotted <laughs> food dishes. You think of something like haggis. Uh, there's a, actually a, um, a, a technique done by the Montagné in northern Quebec where they take the stomach of, of caribou and they put all of the organs inside the stomach and they hang the stomach in a tree and they let it sit in the sun for two weeks and then they come back and they eat that. It's like this slop. Well, then, you know, and it's, they can eat it without poisoning themselves. Uh, there's an awful lot of meat we can eat raw. Uh, we aren't going to do it in an enjoyment situation, but we are going to do it in a survival situation. And I think the squeamishness we have 
on what we could and should eat in a in a do or die survival situation is something that uh, you have to get over that if you really want to survive sometimes eating some rotten meat is not going to kill you and it's going to give you nourishment that said it's a judgment call and it's not an easy judgment call I had kind of fun building that shelter actually what is that well I've got the shelter pretty much where I wanted it today a good roof to shed the rain a place where I can crawl inside and get out of the rain one two maybe three hours of actual sunlight left take my hand touch the bottom to the sun and count down the widths of my hand till I hit the horizon it gives me an hour each time I like I like that little lesson I've taught that a couple of times in the episodes and it's true I mean each, everybody's hand is a different size right but one two three but mine actually seems to represent 15 minutes per finger so it works out really nicely for me right because there's an hour and uh, that method boy that's served me very well uh, in a lot of situations because you just if you're doing something you're taking a chance on you want to time it out um, you need to know how much time you have left in the day. The case, That's an important thing to know in a survival dinner. situation, especially. Thank you, Eagle. Ah, yeah, okay. Alaska receives it. So that, that little lower third there, we call those lower thirds when you've got printing across the screen. Um, that this was uh, appeasing the network. They were, they were starting, oh, we want to have get the little the factoids, they called them, really factoids. Uh, and um, so that we'd, we'd find the thing that I would say or something about the area and the plop that in there, there as a lower exactly third. You know, it, it, it's not bad. It's a good idea. It gave a lot of good information out, but I also found it a little bit didactic, a little bit dry and boring. Um, and I fought it a bit. But uh, in the end, wasn't that big of a thing to oh, compromise man. about. Oh, there you go, see? Wow. The taste of cooked Nothing food. About eating it now, eh? in, a now you see it all cooked. in a survival situation. This is going to be a good night. There you go. This is a beautiful place. Fire, shelter, and basically a, a salmon to eat. I don't know what it was, trout it salmon. Actually it's hard to tell. Midnight. Not very dark. Well, this is the end of day three, I think. I'm starting to lose track. Hopefully I won't get too much smoke inhalation in this shelter. But I'm gonna see if I can try and get some sleep. Wake up every now and then, look for bears, and stoke the fire. Oh, I can't believe how good that fish made me feel. So a few things went on. My daughter's emailing me, emailing me right now while I'm watching this. I mean, One small mistake can turn deadly. Oh yeah. First, there's a few things about this episode that, as I said, there's some behind the scenes stuff that I gotta tell you about, but let's check out the fire, the burn down scene first, because this was the real deal. This was, it's all the real deal, but this was just like, couldn't believe I made this mistake. Time in my life, my shelter caught fire. You should have seen it. It was a big ball of flame in the sky. Fortunately, there was this hanging around. If not for that one piece of junk on the beach, bucket, my shelter would have been a massive bonfire. Oh, man. So I've splashed water all over the top, and I've pulled what was left of the coals outside to keep the fire going. And uh, I've soaked the front entranceway. fire did not go to where the plastic was on the roof. It was over in the fire area where the flames were supposed to lick up, but I guess they just kept drying out and drying out the wood up above it. I let the flames get too high. Wow. Yep. That was, I don't think I'd ever done that before in practicing survival any time. Do we have uh, I remember as a guide guiding people, well, teaching them survival, we did on one situation, on one occasion, have a couple. And uh, they happened to have left the their night. shelter, but they had I'm a fire really going inside and came back to a huge inferno, had, almost you know, started a forest fire, fire kind of thing. Because that's what, close these are big, ma your, your, your shelter is always a big pile of, it's a big tinder bundle. Wow. That's what it is. It's, and uh, catch it on fire and who knows how far that's going to go from there. About 12 or 13 feet. 
So I'm going to head over to what looks like a much larger tidal zone across the bay and see what I can find there. Hopefully the pickings will be a little bit better and I can get something to eat. So, I just sit here and wait for the tide to come in. Okay, that's long enough. So, a little behind the scenes that happened here, while I was going out to do this, and um, to be fair, I mean, I framed it out because there was no point in getting into the story, but everyone, people have asked me, have you ever run into anybody out there? And on occasion, I've said this before, yeah, I have. I ran into a hunter in the Arizona episode. Um, it was really strange. I've, ran, uh, I've run into people in different places. It just happens, and I kind of avoid them or carry on. In this case, it was a big ship. There was a big, huge ship that came in there, and they were doing testing on salmon, I think it was. Uh, and... Uh, so while I was in there filming, and uh, they gave me some funny looks. I mean, I, I did say hi to them. I talked to them for about 10 minutes, you know. I was in my state in the sea kayak, and, uh, and then paddled away, and that was the end of it. Um, but unbeknownst to me, a few things had gone on. So how do I premise this? First of all, I'll premise it this way and say that I never shoot any of my episodes in a park. I can't do what I need to do if I'm going to be in any kind of national, you know, public park. Um, I always have to get uh, permission, uh, which I do. I get government permission to film. I get permission for different land places. Um, that is all taken care of uh, so that I'm legal wherever I'm filming. And. Uh, this particular time, I, my producer, my field producer, who helps me organize everything, he knew very well this was the, my this mandate, is my M.O., and you never film in a park. You know, we've got to really get our permission from the government to film in the province, that sort of thing, in this case in the state, but never in a park. And he assured me, yeah, yeah, absolutely, and he didn't check the maps properly. And... We didn't realize, but there was like this line that sort of cut like that, like the park had a square boundary that was, I guess, kind of arbitrary on the land. But it, anyway, it meant that I was inside this park filming. So now, unbeknownst to me, because I still thought I wasn't in a park, I'm filming in a park, and so the permitting that I had was no good. I'm a Canadian in America, in the United now States, eating, filming uh, without a permit in, an, in a national park or whatever kind of park it was, but I didn't this, know that. So uh, I was, Goose you know, I was, I was innocent in, in my that. ignorance, I guess. Mm. Anyway, the ship that I ran into, um, for whatever reason, I don't even know why, really, but I guess they'd called the park headquarters to say, hey, there's a guy out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, he's alone. Like I guess that was the big thing. Was I was out there alone, and that does tend to freak a lot of people out, especially back then. Like, like, they just you know would get this all freaked out that uh, somebody's out there alone. And what ends up happening is uh, authorities start like thinking, "We don't want you dying on our time. We're not going to be liable for you." And so you get stopped a lot of times from doing things. Um, and I've had to. Um, you know, dance my way around a few situations. This situation here was going to be a very delicate dance because I was doing something that I could be, I guess, fine for. So they called it in, and uh, but I didn't know that. That was on this day, and I'll finish the story in a bit when we get to what happened uh, a day or two from now. Love seeing the sea otters. Actually, those were river otters. Scavenge my own beach for supplies. Well, so really that you just missed me getting a wild edibles, get uh, a, a, a lot, the, the training that I did. Was low, so, so now I'm doing the scavenging. Beach, so much stuff on a beach. It's kind of a bummer here. to be honest with you. Right, but you never find a beach that doesn't have a lot of well, junk on it line, that in survival you can got. use. But do, of course, it's unfortunate that it's there because it's pollution. Um, but I've always said that you know my point was to teach and to train you different survival skills. So. I would um, Still, day two, day three, uh, day go four. out on the land first and oh, learn, really and so uh, going yet. And, uh, Fiona Chambers uh, is um, uh, can really mess with your uh, mind after a while. What is she? Staying Anthropological more than one survivor from botany. And some of these survivors I don't remember. She's really smart. That's all I can remember. And uh, she here. is one of she's pretty much an expert like on uh, Aboriginal cultures and uh, their agro it's agricultural uh, history and perspectives and, and knowledge. And so I had gone out with her. I, might be I believe on this one. Is that right? 
Oh, no, you know, I'm right. jumping way ahead. I worked with her on the Tofino no, one that's with my movie. son. My so, bandana. okay, forget everything I just said. And I just want to when we get to the Tofino show, and I'm going to have Logan sitting beside me while we do that, um, director's commentary. Terry, we'll, we'll talk about that. I can't remember who taught me on this one, but I did go here. out with somebody and did some training on what I could eat and not eat. I can actually thin that edge down using the flint napping. So flint napping, what I'm doing right here, is a primitive technology. It's really a beautiful skill, uh, and it's a one very much worth learning. And you could do it on actual glass, and that's all I'm doing there. So that the glass has a nice point. And I do that by a little bit of grinding called pressure flaking. Take some practice to get this. As you can see. Obsidian works well. Shards of glass there. I'm just breaking them off the edge. I see that. I'll try and get in there. There we go. It's hard to show you, but that's one edge done almost to a point. It's very difficult. All I'm using is this crude stone. But it works. It basically take something like glass or obsidian because or flint, you and you knife, and you've got this this you piece, and you're, you're napping, you can make a knife until you have this point, and you do that by you know, you're grinding oh. away like this. <laughs> but in that case, I broke the glass. Oh, man, all that effort. Uh, that and you do that sometimes, even with a piece of flint or obsidian, you know, you're, you're grinding it and you break the whole oh. thing. Uh, but you can make that's frustrating. a nice, strong, cutting edge this way with flint napping. Flint napping's a tremendous right, primitive skill to learn. It's just a hunk of plastic. Let's see what I'm doing here. Pretty good, but I'm a little worried it might be too big. I can always try. There we go. That's the tail left over from that. That is fish. traditional we'll fishing. In the middle of it. And look at it. All that junk. Float everything. The bait from the tail that I found. So I've got Make a hook. Out on its hook. The thin line that goes up to the big rope. The big rope that goes up, and I've got a, um, a float that I found lying around here. I just saw a huge school of salmon just go swimming right past me here. Tomorrow I've got to get a net out. That's for sure. <sighs> well, as you can see, I got my fire going, and I'm keeping it a lot farther away from the shelter tonight. There's salmon jumping all around, so with any luck at all, something will smell the bait on the You know, and... Alaska is one of those places, like the Arctic, like so many, that um, I used to say you could just throw the camera on the ground and you'll get a good angle. It's a filmmaker's paradise for sure. It's not, not hard to get a great angle when you set the camera up. Around me, and it's, oh, it's warming the small of my back right now. Otherwise, I'd be pretty chilled. Shelter is probably going to, going to be a dry one and that it'll keep the rain away, but there's no warmth. And I'm too nervous to have a fire inside. So a lot of times what I would do is uh, I would let the camera kind of just run uh, and uh, get that get me sleeping kind of thing, um, or I'd fall asleep and it would just run. Um, I've been asked a lot about uh, solar power, how I keep batteries charged, things like that. Go check my fish Basically, out. I just uh, take in um, single thing. the, uh, the ba enough batteries with me. It makes my pack no heavy, sure but there's no the way to, to solar charge it. At least there wasn't in these days. Uh, and and that's what would so work, you know. I would. Fortunately, the cameras got smaller and the batteries got smaller and lasting longer, so lasted longer. So uh, all of that together meant that it just got easier and easier along the way to carry the batteries with me. Uh, but there were times where on the last day, I'm like, oh man, I got 28 minutes of battery power left. And I had to really think about and pick and choose what I was going to film as my final scenes with, uh, you know, with the battery uh, ready to die on me. The two big floats, now I've got to scrounge around and see what else I can find and use as a float. And then the tough part will be trying to tie it, some rocks on the other side as anchors. This one wasn't going to work as a float because there's already holes in it from bear teeth. Some big old bear has been chewing on this thing. So it'll make an anchor instead.
Oh boy. I don't know if this is even going to be possible, but uh, the only water I can actually walk to on this site is up through this dry creek bed. I mean, it's, it's gushing up at the top there, so hopefully I won't have to go very far before I start to see it coming through the ground and I can get myself some fresh water. Otherwise, I'll have to hop into the kayak and paddle over. I'm not far from some falls, but it's just kind of a drag to have to get in the kayak every time I need water. This, this was an interesting moment for me going up to get the water. I go up and I think I mentioned it that I felt like I was being watched. And isn't that interesting when you think about what happens later. I found a way to bring some of the water back to my camp using the shaft of the paddle. Of course, it means that I have to make sure I don't spill it all the way, but hey, it works. And the more water I can get back to the camp, the less I have to come up this climb to get this fresh water. Look what I found here. Check this out. Fiddleheads. Hmm. This is a nice surprise. Where there's water, there's always food. Now, the thing about not bitter, when you when you find a stream like that and you don't have sure big more uh, bladder bags or bottles or anything, you can bring the water back with you. Creek here. <laughs> you bring it back in your stomach. Fall. And I would, I you know, you didn't see me do it, but I would gorge and, and gorge and just try to fill myself up with as much water. Every survival situation uh, being here, you know, basically overhydrated is a great drink. thing. Sure, you're going to pee a lot of it yeah. out, but um, I would just drink and drink and drink and drink. And so when I did go back right, to those streams there. like that, that is back one of the of techniques that location. works in a survival situation there, to help keep true. you going. He's the other thing it does is it makes you feel a little bit full. Calm. You're already, fact, your stomach's growling, you're hungry, you want food, and yet... You're Still filling yourself like up shot. with water, so and, no and, and if you have quick access no to, to water, then I would do it constantly, really? just, just constantly. Um, and that's important. Uh, it helps a lot in survival. Most likely, they'll just take off. While I leave the fish net out, oh, here's the scene. High tide. It's time to try and make my shelter just a bit more comfortable. Now, I don't think we show it here. No, we don't show it. It's just me doing, there, there, I looked up to the left there. And there's a whole bunch of other scenes where I keep looking off to the left or the right or whatever. <sighs> Bit of a mat to lay on now instead of the rocks. So I'd been doing this scene. This was the moment right then and there where I had that big ape-like sound bellowing at me from the forest five different times, you know, times in a row, very, very loud. Um, but the camera, I'd, I'd finished all the whole grass scene and I put the camera aside. I just wasn't filming anymore. So uh, I, I, I was just done, you know, um, and was getting the grass to go over the shelter. And so now it's, it's after this, that's happened. Um, and I didn't want to let on or talk about it at all because I was there to do the Survivor Man show. And I, I, I was there to, to teach these skills. I didn't want to confuse things by talking about, I think I just saw slash heard a Bigfoot. I didn't want to go there. It was going to be the wrong place to go. It wasn't a bear and it wasn't a moose. So what it was, I can't tell you, but it sounded like a big, great ape, except that this is Alaska. So that was kind of bizarre. That, that, so I had the, the, the ship that I, that I saw the previous day or this day, whatever it was, and I saw, um, I had that moment where I was up, uh, that was one thing. Then when I was up getting the drinking water, I kept feeling like somebody was watching me. I just had that creepy feeling. Um, and then this is just shortly after that, that I'm doing the grass and that's when that, that whole thing happens. So how long, whatever it was, was there, I don't know, but man, it was loud and it sounded just like a great ape bellowing from the jungle sort of thing. It's bizarre. It's still bizarre. Music from my good friend Peter Kleesh. There we go. It's like a night at the cottage. Except that I have no food, no friends, and no beer. Huh. Sitting in a hammock right now, as a matter of fact. It's five days. More food than usual. But I need some real food. I was sure I was going to get a fish on this show. 
this morning of day six. <sighs> Big bank of fog has rolled in. Not a good sign at all for me weather-wise. I'm gonna go check my net because I have an extremely low tide right now. Cross your fingers. What I hope to find is one or two fish entangled and ready for the grabbing. All I need is one fish, just one fish. Well, in this case, I preferred somebody just feeding me with a fish rather than teaching me how to. Unfortunately, somebody should have taught me how to because uh, this junk net just sort of floating in the ocean wasn't, uh, wasn't doing me any good at all. I'm going to kayak into the middle of the fjord to go fishing. But with the camera still making me dangerously top-heavy and the water still as cold as ever, I need to make something to help stabilize the kayak. I'm much more secure and stable now, especially because I'm putting a camera mount up high, making the kayak top-heavy. Well, it had nothing to do with survival, but it was kind of fun filmmaking. That's the kayak emergency uh, balloon, and then the junk that I found there. There are salmon jumping on either side of me. Enough to take my bait, though. Oh, well, here, here's my bait. Nice big hunk of fish guts there for you. As I was saying before, I was really interrupted by the multitude of jumping salmon all around my kayak. Hey, some more food. Look at that. Yes. Whoa. Mm. Bull kelp. And I can eat it. That's a nice chunk. Wow. Well, if I don't get any fish, I've got this. Killer. That's the bonus of getting out and about. Now, how the heck do I strap this in? That's an important point, you know. Um, when you huddle in and do nothing, you don't find anything you don't find things there's, you have there's no advantage uh, that come evident become evident to you once you get up and get proactive and get doing things in a survival situation you always find something you can use and in this case just going out and trying to fish landed me this big hunk of bull kelp and I can eat it it's not even rockfish it's kelp but it is edible and that's quite a meal and for now, it's going to have to do. So unless there's something on that little makeshift net over there, it's kelp for dinner. Huh. You can see the fish jump in behind me. Good. I don't think I see anything on that net. And that is the reality of trying to survive, especially when you're alone. There's only one person to do everything. I was hoping that net would kind of be like a second person for me and just hang out there and catch a fish. <laughs> okay, hang on. I forgot that there was fish jumping in behind me while I was doing this, and I didn't, clearly I didn't even know it. Uh, ironic. It hasn't done anything. Maybe if I was here a lot longer, it would, but in two days, it's done nothing. So, here's, what, here's the next part of that story of what happened. So, uh, while I was out doing that fishing, I was pretty far from my location, and, and uh, th I hear this airplane uh, flying, and I'm thinking, man, it's really close to my shelter. Um, and sure enough, it was a float plane, and it landed. So I go scooting back, and uh, hey, what's going on? There's a guy standing up there on the shore with a clipboard looking at my shelter. There's another guy standing there with a gun. Uh, sort of not on the draw, but just sort of like ready, um, pilot in the plane. And um, turns out that the ship had called in and said, there's this lone guy out there. And uh, I guess, I don't know, they were checking in on me. So this go, this, these guys came in and not only had my field producer made a mistake and I was uh, filming in a park, but I was also staying on what was considered uh, heritage, sacred heritage land of the Aboriginal community. So I don't know how many rules I was breaking, but they were not happy. But they were decent enough because I said, you know what, all right, you know, I'll, let me finish what I'm doing here and I'll come in. And they were decent enough to, enough to say, okay, when you're finished, you better come in and see us. And I'll finish, uh, I'll finish that story in a bit for what happened.
Well, this is almost all that's left of that dead fish that I found that I've been using as bait. But I did take some of it and I had it soaking in the water. Now, it's been a few days. I, I really was hoping it wasn't going to come to this. I expected to have some fresh fish, but I just washed this guy off. But I'm going to cook it. The way I'm going to cook it is I'm going to wrap it in that bull kelp, which is actually a traditional way for cooking fish. This is what I mean. You know, that that's basically no, what no someone would this. call as this just rotted fish, like a good but idea. I know that uh, I can, my stomach well, can still handle it. Nothing, I'm just, it's not going to poison me and make me sick. I can eat it. Which I could use. There we go. I'll leave that to cook for a while. It'll be the last bit of nutrition I'll actually get out here. Lucky with the weather, not so lucky with the fishing. Anyone who's tried it knows how that can be. All the skill in the world won't make the fish bite. Oops, I'll try to keep it on the stick. There we go. So, this is my four day old piece of fish, what's left of my fish bait, wrapped in bull kelp and uh, cooked. So, in essence, it's kind of like steaming it. <laughs> Try to get it in my mouth. Okay, it doesn't taste so fresh, but I'm going to eat it. <laughs> to get food that so this was a, this whole this whole shoot was a very strange shoot for me in terms of just the ambiance, the feel of it. First of all, I, I had that whole weird experience up by the creek, feeling like I was being watched. Then I had the experience with the gorilla sound in the tree beside me on the shelter lobby. Then I had the boat that I ran into, and they were just weird on that boat. And then I had the authorities come in and talk to me. And this well, whole you, time, I was just bear, in the beginning of going through a now, really nasty divorce. So emotionally, like uh, I was fish. off so kilter sure as well. This was probably emotionally, keep my knife handy. next to Argentina, knife, this was probably emotionally one of the most difficult the survivor men shows I ever had to film simply because, you know, when I got out there and I knew that the, the divorce was definitely happening and definitely going through, I was very distraught about um, the loss of, um, of full time with my children because I knew that it was going to be split time now and I was very, very distraught about that. I was used to full time with my kids and, and knowing that that split was going to happen scared me. And so this was a very strange fresh water episode to film and uh make myself some tea you can hear my energy draining 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 i don't know what day this is five or six oh, yeah. i think it's six to show you, I, think. I can't yeah see i can't really get down in there because of the heat but uh this time it's working I've got a good rolling boil going on there. So, I've got myself some tea. I will say it. Oh, let's blow some harp. Well, my, I've said this before, a couple of things you can't get in a survival situation, and often you can't get even on a camping trip, a canoe, like say a canoe trip, uh, hot things to drink and ice cold things to drink. And here with the icy cold stream and the ability now to boil water in that little bottle, I've got both. And those two things, what is it? What, so what's the big deal? Who cares? The big deal is... Um, yeah. They, those two things make you feel human again. It's like having a shower uh, or, or washing off in the lake, getting all clean. You feel human again. And a survival situation has a way of making you feel very inhuman, making you feel odd and not yourself. So when you can do things that make you feel yourself, like drink some tea, I think I found peppermint or something like that, or have ice cold water on a hot moment, or get all cleaned up, washed off you just feel again. yourself again. And when you feel yourself again, respect. you can affect better survival. Uh, Think better. And once it gets daylight enough, it looks like I'll end this week 
the same way I started it. Paddling in the cold and the wet and the wind. After my one hour of nighttime darkness, the sky lightens again and I return to my kayak to paddle out to safety. Alaska is powerfully beautiful. It's a place on Earth that <laughs> presents some of the greatest Paddle out to safety and right to the cop shop. Not only beauty, yep, right to the authorities. So um, paddled out, got picked up, uh, went into the town, can't remember where it was, and um, went into the, uh, the office and Basically, they were cool with everything because it, it was it was an accident sort of thing. It was like, oops. And um, so, because I had permits, but they were for a different area, and I was just basically in the wrong area. I blame my field producer for this one. Ooh, I was ticked at him. We went in there, and we danced around this with, with the authorities, and uh, ended up... The fine went from like $300, and then they kept going in and talking to a superior and come back and be up another $500 and come go out and come, and come back in, up another five. By the end of it all, I think it was $2,800 in fines uh, for filming in a park without a permit. Um, and I think for camping on uh, heritage land, a few things like that. They just kept fine after fine after fine. I'm like, and I was like, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. I was, there's no way, man, that I was going to, you know, push back on this at all. I mean, I was in the wrong, so there was no, no chance I should. So about that much in fines. Well, then there's a tag, there's an addendum to that story. About a year later, maybe less than that, it turns out that the guy who had been doing the fines was actually a criminal investigator. So that wasn't what he was doing with me, but he is normally a criminal investigator for the parks. And so the park internal publication printed a story about Les Stroud, Survivor Man, and these fines and this situation that happened in the park. But because the guy's name was mentioned, because he was a criminal investigator, it sounded like I'd been arrested for criminal offense, which I had not. But it's, it's a criminal investigator, so-and-so, so-and-so, you know, with uh, Mr. Stroud, blah, blah, blah. So it sounded really bad. This was in the internal publication for, the, I think, the National Park Service. The guy, one guy who worked for the National Park Service had this publication. His wife worked at the Discovery Channel, and then the Discovery Channel, she took this into the channel. Then the channel calls me, and they're freaking out because, like, what are you doing? What happened? You didn't tell us you got arrested. It's like, I didn't get arrested. It was just an oops. It was some fine stuff, and it was just this whole big thing. All because my field producer failed to look at the map closer than as close as he should have. Um, and then on top of that, as I've mentioned, I was that was the beginning of a bad period where I was going through divorce. And then there was the, you know this whole Bigfoot thing or whatever was going on. I don't know, but uh, it definitely uh, it definitely opened up a whole new world because it would be a few years later that that after that, that uh, I was on the Opie and Anthony show and they asked me if I'd ever seen Bigfoot and I, it prompted me to tell them about this, tell them this story. And that's when the world exploded and I started to do that series. But um, that was Alaska. Again, I think the power of Alaska is, as it is with so many places, you could just throw that camera on the ground and it would get something beautiful, get a beautiful angle no matter what. All right, that's this uh, episode of Director's Commentary. So. Uh, not sure what I'm going to watch next. I think I'm going to check into another uh, Beyond Survival uh, episode where I go out and survive with the different uh, remote cultures. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you for the next one.